Hi everyone, today we will discuss the Munina-Podel theorem, a result that opens the door to many ideas in comparison geometry. The theorem goes as follows, if we have a simple closed smooth regular curve in the plane, and its absolute curvature is at most one at each point, then it contains a unit disk somewhere in its interior. Let's begin with some definitions. We say that two smooth regular curves, gamma 1 and gamma 2, are tangent at a point P0, corresponding to the time parameters T1 and T2 for gamma 1 and gamma 2 respectively, if the velocity of gamma 1 at time T1 is parallel to the velocity of gamma 2 at time T2. In such a case, we say that the curves are co-oriented if these velocity vectors point in the same direction, and counter-oriented if the velocity vectors point in opposite directions. Assume that two plane curves, gamma 1 and gamma 2, are tangent. We say that gamma 1 locally supports gamma 2 at P if there is some epsilon and a region R in the plane such that gamma 2 remains in the closure of the region R along the interval T2 minus epsilon, T2 plus epsilon, that is, right before passing through P and right after passing through P, and the portion of gamma 1 corresponding to the interval T1 minus epsilon, T1 plus epsilon, is a portion of the boundary of R. If the curves are co-oriented and the portion of gamma 1 goes counterclockwise around R, just like in the picture, we say that gamma 1 locally supports gamma 2 from the right. Similarly, if they are co-oriented and the portion of gamma 1 goes clockwise around R, we say that gamma 1 locally supports gamma 2 from the left. An equivalent way to think about this is the following. If two tangent curves are co-oriented, we can set up a coordinate system for which the x-axis points in the direction of the tangent vector to the curves at P. Then the curves in a small neighborhood of P become the graphs of two functions f1 and f2. Gamma 1 supports gamma 2 from the right if f1 is less or equal to f2 along a small interval. It turns out there is a second derivative test to see if given two tangent planar curves, one curve supports the other or not. If gamma 1 and gamma 2 are tangent and co-oriented at times t1 and t2 respectively, then if gamma 1 locally supports gamma 2 from the right, then its curvature at the corresponding time is bounded above by the 1 of gamma 2. And if the curvature of gamma 1 at time t1 is strictly less than the curvature of gamma 2 at time t2, then gamma 1 supports gamma 2 from the right at such point. We are talking, of course, about sine curvature in here. Proving this proposition is quite easy using the graph interpretation of supporting curves, and I'll leave it to you. If gamma 1 is a simple curve that separates the plane into regions, we say that gamma 1 globally supports gamma 2 if it lies entirely in one of those regions. And if gamma 1 is closed and gamma 2 lies in its interior, we say that gamma 1 globally supports gamma 2 from the outside. For each smooth regular plane curve gamma, at each point gamma of t, we can construct the tangent line passing through gamma of t and having direction gamma prime of t. We could go further and construct the circle co-orientedly tangent to gamma at gamma of t and having the same sign curvature as gamma at this point. The circle is called the osculating circle of the curve gamma at gamma of t. Notice that the radius of this circle is precisely 1 over the absolute curvature of gamma times t, and it degenerates to a line when such curvature is zero. The moon in the puddle theorem will follow from the following lemma, which we will prove next. The lemma says that if we have a simple smooth regular loop, that is, a smooth regular curve that starts and ends at the same point, but is not necessarily smooth at such point, then the curve supports one of its oscillating circles from the outside. The reason the theorem follows from the lemma is because, under the curvature assumptions of the theorem, the osculating circles on the inside have curvature at most 1 and then radius at least 1. To prove the lemma, consider a loop gamma as in the statement, which without loss of generality we can assume to be traveled counterclockwise. For each p in the curve different from the base point, we can consider the largest circle tangent to the curve at p and contained inside of gamma in our language supported by gamma from the outside. This circle will be called the in-circle of the curve gamma at P. 
Working by contradiction, we can assume that for each p in the curve other than the base point, its encircled gamma is not the osculating circle of gamma at p. This means that the signed curvature of sigma p is strictly greater than the one of gamma at p. That implies, due to the second derivative test, that there is a neighborhood of p in gamma that doesn't intersect sigma p at a point other than p. Now take an arbitrary point p1 in the curve other than the base point and consider its in circle sigma1. Notice that sigma1 touches gamma again at another point. If that was not the case, we could inflate it a little bit more and remain inside of gamma, contradicting the maximality in the definition of in circle. Let gamma1 be an arc of gamma, possibly traveled in reverse direction, that starts at p1 and ends at the next point of intersection with sigma1, which we call q1. We define p2 to be the midpoint of gamma1 and let sigma2 be its in circle. Now let gamma2 be the arc of gamma that starts at p2 and ends at the next point of intersection with sigma2, which we call q2. Here's when we have to make a very important observation. q2 lies in gamma1. In other words, if p2 lies in a portion of gamma between p1 and q1, then so does q2. If that was not the case, sigma2 will have to cross sigma1 in order to touch gamma at a point not in gamma1. By doing so, there will be at least three distinct points of intersection between sigma1 and sigma2. That would imply that sigma1 and sigma2 are actually the same circle. However, by construction, p2 lies in sigma2 but not in sigma1. This proves our claim that q2 also lies in gamma1 the portion of gamma between p1 and q1, where p2 lies. Now choose p3 to be the midpoint of gamma2, which was the portion of gamma from p2 to q2, and repeat the construction inductively. Notice that the length of each arc is at most half of the length of the previous one. The length of gamma2 is half of the length of gamma1, the length of gamma3 is half of the length of gamma2, and so on. This implies that the intersection of all these arcs consists of a single point, p infinity, whose in circle, sigma infinity, touches the curve gamma again at a point, q infinity. But there is a problem. By our claim, for each fixed n, q infinity must lie in gamma n. Since n is arbitrary, this implies that q infinity equals p infinity, but these points are distinct by construction, which is a contradiction. With this lemma we just proved, we could give a quick proof of a classic theorem of differential geometry, the four-vertex theorem. A vertex of a plain smooth regular curve is defined to be a critical point of its curvature, that is, a point where k prime is zero. Since the radius of the oscillating circle is 1 over k, the points where the radius of the oscillating circle attains a local maximum or minimum are vertices. The four vertex theorem says that each simple closed smooth regular curve has at least four vertices. The proof goes as follows. By the lemma we proved, there is a point B1 for which the osculating circle is supported by gamma from the outside. Applying the lemma again, using V1 as the base point, we find another point B2 with the same property, that the osculating circle is supported by gamma from the outside. Then we can perform an inversion, corresponding to the transformation of the complex plane that sends z to 1 over z conjugate. By the same argument, there are points v3 and v4 in the inverted curve whose osculating circles are supported by gamma from the outside. The four vertex theorem now will follow from the following two facts, which I'll leave to you as exercises. If a curve locally supports its osculating circle at a point, then that point is a vertex and inversion sends osculating circles to osculating circles. And that's it for today, see you in the next video!